right, Justina, I see your icon on here. All right. I just realized I was muted, but yeah, I have my camera on. It's showing me to myself. I don't know why it's not showing. I see. Oh, okay. I see you. Great. Okay. I think. I think we're all here. Okay. Very good. Very good. Now let me. Uh... Sarah, can you mute your mic when talking? Are we good? Sounds good to me. I'm waiting on my PowerPoint to come up. I clicked on it and this computer is running just, oh, shall we say a little slowly? There it is. Come on. There you go. It doesn't want, there it is. Okay. All right. Well, I'll still do well on time, but maybe not quite as well as we thought. My goodness, we're getting started 30 minutes later, so whatever that is. It's all right. We'll do all right here. I'm rearranging my screen to uh, suit me. Um, so that I can see everybody where I want you. Okay. So just hang loose a second while I move some things around. There we go. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Is anybody ready to uh, go stir crazy and go home? Oh, wait a minute. Everybody's been stuck somewhere that they call home. That's right. Uh, are you ready for all this to end and get back to life the way you once knew it? I imagine you are. Okay, so we're going to begin tonight, as you know, with a collect. And so I'm going to begin with this. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open. Well, all desires known. I'm not getting this thing. It's not doing what it normally does for me. Ah, there we go. That's what I want. I'm going to come back at this now that I finally got it fixed. It's been an interesting evening. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We were in the prophets and largely spending time with the major prophets. Um, but we, uh, we skipped a couple of things. Most of the time when we do Old Testament surveys of any form. We'll skip Obadiah. Obadiah is there, and that's about all most people have to say for Obadiah. It happens to be there. It's the smallest book in the Old Testament. It's almost entirely taken up with an oracle against the Edomites, um, and it is an indictment of them. Um, it that's about all there is to say for it, really. I mean, we could spend some more time on it, but then you've got Zephaniah, which we don't spend a lot of time on uh, when we do surveys. Um, but Zephaniah uses prophetic framing to uh, show the destruction of what the Hebrews understood as their creation in reverse order. Um, and in the reverse order, you'll recall that creation was um, 
by step by step, day, light, so forth. And the last thing in creation was people. And there's a progressive order. And in Zephaniah, the prophetic methodology is exactly the reverse of that order, where there is a destruction of all that these people call themselves and their inheritance in the land. Uh, it's possible that Zephaniah inspired uh, Josiah's reforms, or at least was one of the voices that did. Uh, but he lived long enough for Josiah to die. And Josiah died in battle against uh, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. And then uh, Zephaniah's writing ends with his despair at the return of apostasy under Jehoahaz. Um, and that's Zephaniah in a nutshell. Um, we, um, we left the uh, story of the exiles having returned in part. We left the story with most of the prophets behind. Those are the two that we really didn't touch on. Um, but there's something else we need to be clear on. The exiles in Babylon were in two categories. The Jewish exiles had two categories. There were the laborers and the craftsmen and their families who were put to work in the enormous public works of Nebuchadnezzar, who built a city on the Euphrates River that rivaled anything in splendor that we read of or, or see in the ancient world. Um, the hanging gardens, terraced gardens, man-made, of Babylon were considered one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. This enormous public works program, building this incredible city and many other cities and all of the temples and all of the irrigation canals. Uh, there are references in um, some of the writings from this period that, uh, and, and later periods that reference uh, rivers with a name other than the great river Euphrates or Tigris. These are almost always canals. These canals are built by these laborers. Now, the Jews aren't the only ones. The uh, Babylonians have created a multinational, multicultural empire. And so they've put all of these various people to work. So this is one category. And then the people of promise, uh, were generally of uh, the noble and merchant class when they were carried away and their children. Um, they were among those who we would call um, the elite, the educated, the connected. And uh, they tended to be accorded certain privileges and put it in quotation marks, freedoms in that their lives were on a day-to-day, -day, ordinary basis, ordinary. Um, they did not um, suffer as physical slaves. Um, and the people who were laborers and craftsmen lived a relatively grueling life, especially in comparison to these people. As time passed, some of the Jews became well-placed, very significant in their foreign exile, and some even became well-to-do. Daniel is one of the ones who is well-placed. Daniel was taken as a hostage. Mm probably about 598 roughly um he probably came from a notable family line during the time of jehoiakim's reign uh, he trained in the service of the royal court of babylon 
they renamed him Belteshazzar or Belteshazzar. Uh, the renaming of someone in scripture in ancient times is important uh, because when you give someone else a new name, that means that they are um, are your subject in a sense. They owe you deference or allegiance. And so when he's renamed, it means you are subject to the one who renamed you. And whether or not the king personally renamed him, it meant that he owed his uh, total allegiance to the king. The king would be Nebuchadnezzar and then those who followed him. Um, Daniel gained this reputation, as did Joseph in so many generations previous, that uh, he could interpret visions and he could recall long forgotten dreams and he could uh, explain what things meant. And over time he became valued and he became an advisor to the throne. And he served a succession of rulers. The last one, his last three years of life, would be Cyrus the Great. Uh, many personal visions, which he interpreted, he interpreted in terms of the future triumph of a messianic kingdom. His own visions were visions of a messianic kingdom that would triumph. His last recorded vision and I noted earlier that he died in the third year of Cyrus' rule, and it was right before his death. When we read Daniel chapter 7, um, this is one of the prototypical visions of Daniel. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babel, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head as he was lying in his bed. He wrote the dream down. This is his count. I had a vision at night. I saw there before me the four winds of the sky breaking out over the great sea, and four huge animals came up out of the sea, each different from the others. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted off the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a human heart was given it. Then there was another animal, a second, like a bear. It raised itself up on one side. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and gorge yourself with flesh. After this, I looked. And there was another one, like a leopard, with four bird's wings on its side. The animals also had four heads. And it was given power to rule. It was given power to rule. After this, I looked in the night visions, and there before me was a fourth animal. Dreadful, horrible, extremely strong, with great iron teeth. It devoured, crushed, and stamped its feet on what was left. It was different from all the animals that had gone before, and it had ten horns. I want to stop here and, and insert parenthetically that um, I heard more than one sermon as a child and a teen and a young adult on the vision of Daniel 7, and it was always preached as an interpretation of uh, something happening before our eyes in current times, and it had all of the hallmarks of uh, whatever the current uh, focus was among uh, premillennial dispensationalists. And it was always reinterpreted in terms of Russia, the United States, China, and the European Union, and all of these things. Um, let's go a little further. While I was considering the horns, another horn sprang up from among them, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. In this horn were eyes like human eyes, and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient One took his seat. Wait a minute, what? The Ancient One took his seat. 
His clothing was white as snow. The hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and wheels of burning fire. A stream of fire flowed from his presence. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Millions and millions stood before him. Then the court was convened. And the books were opened. I kept watching. Then, because of the arrogant words which the horn was speaking, I watched as the animal was killed. Its body was destroyed, and it was given over to be burned up completely. As for the other animals, their rulership was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a time and a season. The first half of Daniel 7. Notice that the beasts fight for primacy. Notice that the rulers and powers are all subject to the ancient one. Notice that the multitudes minister not to the various beasts fighting for power, but to the ancient of ages. The ancient one controls the time and the end of every entity in the vision. The almighty power is clearly the ancient one and all others are subject to that particular power so if we carry on i kept watching the night visions when i saw coming with the clouds of heaven someone like a son of man he approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. To him was given rulership. Him To him was given rulership. Glory and a kingdom. So that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rulership as in, is an eternal rulership. That will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit deep within me was troubled. The visions in my head frightened me. I approached one of those standing by and asked him what all this really meant. He said that he would make me understand how to interpret. These four huge animals are four kingdoms that will arise on earth, but the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom for ever. Yes, forever and ever. And it goes on with more but the point is this this son of man in the vision is different from all the others he just floats in shows up and he is given authority and dominion and given it forever and ever so if you pick that up I wanted to know what the fourth beast meant, the one that was different from all the others, the one that was terrifying with iron teeth and bronze nails, which devoured, crushed, and stamped its feet on what was left, and what the ten horns on its head meant. Isn't it always interesting that the big terrible monster in the movie is the one we want to know more about, but the hero of the movie, you know, that comes in and is going to walk away at the end of the movie, we're not asking about the hero, we want to know more about the monster. Isn't that interesting? And the other horn, which sprang up before which three fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking arrogantly and seemed greater than the others. I watched, and that horn made war with the holy ones and was winning. That horn made war with the holy ones and was winning until the ancient one came. Judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High. And the time came for the holy ones to take over the kingdom. This is what he said. The fourth animal will be a fourth kingdom. It will be different from the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and yet another will arise after them. Now he will be different from the earlier ones, and he will put down three kings. He will speak words against the Most High. 
and try to exhaust the holy ones of the Most High. He will attempt to alter the seasons and the law, and the holy ones will be handed over to him for a time, times and time and a half time. But when the court goes into session, he will be stripped of his rulership, which will be consumed and destroyed completely. Then the kingdom, the rulership, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will serve and obey them. The picture is of the beasts waging war against the saints and ultimately beginning to overpower them. But then the Ancient of Days passes judgment. And the Ancient of Days passes judgment in favor of the Holy Ones, the saints. If you'll notice, the beasts may kill the saints, but if you read closely, God can simply raise the saints up again. That's the Ancient One. The Ancient One has even power over death. The saints seem to follow this Son of Man, and in each case, those who remain faithful and who do not side with those opposed to the Ancient One will inherit the kingdom without end. That's quite a messianic prophecy. And for Daniel, given where he comes in the story, he serves during the time of the Babylonian exile, and with what he knows of his world, this picture is a picture of how the Ancient One, God Almighty, will triumph and will ultimately triumph on, on behalf of his people and who will save his people and give them the promised inheritance for an everlasting time, which was his promise to Abram and Daniel would be couched in the understanding of the covenant promise of God through Abram, Moses, and even the one that God made to David about his house. Heaven is an apocalyptic text. It is in the literary genre of apocalyptic. It is this phantasmagora of imagery and it's something right out of a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> but in it is reflected the hope of a coming Messiah who will come not like everyone else, but will come in peace and will be granted authority because he is obedient to the Ancient One and will win by default not by having superior weapons. So we have in this apocalyptic writing the picture of the Messiah as the Son of Man. This Son of Man imagery and language shows up repetitively also in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is an exilic prophet. And so there is uh, in the Son of Man imagery, a similarity in these two things by people who probably have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And I believe that, uh, and we don't have time to get into all the whys and wherefores, I believe that the primary location of Ezekiel's ministry was in Judah, Judah not in Babylon. And um, the obvious focus of and location of the ministry of Daniel was in Babylon. And yet here they are both using the Son of Man imagery. They are both talking about an ultimate victory of Almighty God and a, an establishment of his people forevermore. Um, the imagery is very different, but the basic thought that comes through is similar. And when we look at the servant songs of Deutero-Isaiah, we find that they present this messianic hope in the form of a suffering servant. 
these no New Testament motifs, son of God, son of man, the suffering servant, they all show up in the exilic prophets and in Deutero, Deutero Isaiah and those who come after. Uh, if you read in chapter 42 of Isaiah, the mission of the servant is to bring justice by persuasion. Chapter 49, the servant is a model of trust, and he, even when he has no strength, he will convert Israel. In chapter 50, the servant's role encompasses suffering and rejection. By accepting his suffering, the servant will be supported by God and will emerge victorious. And then you have in chapter 52, where God uses the unmerited violence of evil ones against a servant to save other guilty people. What is the time of Deutero Isaiah? The time of Deutero Isaiah is contemporary to and following that of these exilic prophets. The focus of Shemuel, Samuel, is on earthly kings and their obedience to God. The focus of the ex exiles is on the heavenly king and upon what this heavenly king will bring to his people. Zechariah picks up the theme of the messianic day with a considerable emphasis upon the Messiah as the spring of David. Malachi takes up the danger of being morally and religiously not lax and not being prepared for the day when the righteous ones are restored. Uh, Malachi 3.20, But you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. And you will break out leaping like calves released from the stall. There is worship music, both ancient worship music and contemporary worship music that pick up the imagery in this very verse. Malachi predicts a new Elijah. Yeah. And Jesus says John the Baptist is one like unto Elijah. You can read that in Matthew 11 and Matthew 17. Malachi, chronologically, is the last of the prophets. And um, from Malachi to Jesus, there's what we call the 400 years of silence. But right at the end of our entire Old Testament corpus, right at the end of the entire Tanakh, here is a prediction of a new Elijah. And when the story picks up, Jesus, the Messiah himself, will say that John the Baptist is likened to a new Elijah. The way these things carry on, the way the prophets picture a day to come where there is uh, this messianic imagery of a peaceable one, a gentle one, a conquering one nonetheless, one who will conquer through suffering rather than imposing suffering, one who will stand with those who hurt rather than hurt them. Um, all of these kinds of pictures come out in these exilic prophets from the time of late Jeremiah, early Ezekiel, <clears throat> and also Zephaniah all the way through to where we pick up the story with the New Testament. And I just wanted to kind of bring the prophetic part of the story to its, its picture of the prophets tell God's truth. They are forth tellers. But as they do so, they are picturing, envisioning, dreaming, of 
the day when the promise of God, the promise of the ancient one, the visit of vision of the ancient one will come to pass on earth. And when the writers of the New Testament uh, start to write about the stories of Jesus and the apostles, they will look back on Malachi and Zechariah uh, and um, Deutero-Isaiah and will make liberal use of those writings as they talk about Jesus as the Son of God, the Lamb for sinners slain, the Savior of the world. You notice that Psalms is put way further back in the uh, Old Testament in the Jewish corpus than it is in ours, than it is in uh, what we normally call the Old and New Testament Bibles made for Catholics and Protestants. And then Daniel's way back there too. The Psalms, well, the Psalms are reflective of a lot. And if you go back, and you need to look it up now. Jehiliam, book one. Book one is Psalms 1 through 41. We're not going to read all 41. We are going to read one and two together. I think the first thing I learned to memorize after John 3.16 was the entirety of Psalm 1. I probably learned that when I was six, maybe seven years old. I learned it in King James English. But we're going to read, um, starting with uh, Justina, can you hear me? Let's read Psalm 1, which is not very long, as you know, six verses. So I'm just going to go off of what I see and hear on my screen. So I'll go, Debbie, why don't you read about three, and then Lindsay, you read about three, and then we'll read number two. Okay. Verses, I mean. Okay. How blessed are those who reject the advice of the wicked, don't stand on the way of sinners, or sit where scoffers sit. Their delight is in Adonai's Torah. On his Torah they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams. They bear their fruit in season. Their leaves never wither. Everything they do succeeds. Not so the wicked who are like chaff driven by the wind. For this reason the wicked won't stand up to the judgment, nor will sinners at the gathering of the righteous. Adonai watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Yeah. I'm trying to get to this. All right. Does that sound different to your ear than what you might recall having learned long ago? I don't think you learned to say that you delight in his Torah. I didn't. Okay. How blessed are those who reject the advice of the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners or sit with scoffers. Sit. Their delight is in Adonai's Torah. On his Torah they meditate day and night. Listen to this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. 
and he shall be like a tree planted by the streams of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also doth not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. They are like trees planted by streams. They bear their fruit in season, their leaves never wither. Everything they do succeeds. Have you ever traveled in the... Uh, Oh, the Great Plains and uh, the High Plains of the American West, let's say, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Wyoming, Western Kansas, the Dakotas, Montana. If you ever travel there, you won't have any trouble telling where the rivers and the streams are. Because that's where you'll find the trees. Because uh, they don't have as much water as we're accustomed to in this part of the world. Uh, those of us who live in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi, we're used to three, four, five times the amount of water in rain and snow as they see in a year's time and so you can see where the water is real fast that's where the trees are and in new mexico uh, the cottonwood trees are common along the rio grande and as you get further north in the state along the san juan river in northwestern New Mexico along the San Juan, uh, it's scrub high plains desert. But along the San Juan, it's beautiful and lush and green all the time because there's water there, ample amount of water all year long. And the cottonwood trees grow mature once as much as 90 or 100 feet tall. They put out an enormous foliage and they're not evergreen, but in the season when they, uh, they're producing pollens, they put off this fuzzy stuff that's everywhere. And uh, it's why they're called cottonwoods. It's not cotton and you can't spin it, but uh, it's dry and it has kind of the look the wispiness of cotton floating in the air and it's everywhere um, and those trees last for ages it's this picture that those who delight in the word of Adonai are like that they are incredibly productive and fruitful and great and strong and they endure. It's a great picture. And then you get this immediate contrast, right? What's verse 4 say, Amy? Not so the wicked who are like chaff driven by the wind. Yeah. So suddenly you've got this uh, juxtaposition of exactly the opposite, correct? And the rest of that those three verses are uh, the opposite of what was introduced at the beginning. Now, Amy, if you can, let's read uh, chapter 2. If you'll read the first three verses, and then Sarah, if you'll read 4, 5, and 6. We'll start, and Justine, if you'll read 7, 8, 9, and 10. Fire away. Why are the nations in an uproar? The people, the people's grumbling in vain. The earth's kings are taking positions. Leaders are conspiring together against Adonai and his anointed. They cry, let's break their fetters. Let's throw off their chains. Unmute your microphone. 
Sarah, are you here? Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay. He who sits in heaven laughs, Adonai looks at them in desertion. Then in his anger, he rebukes them, terrifies them in his fury. I myself have installed my king on Tizmon, Zion. my holy my holy mountain. Okay. I will pro proclaim the decree Adonai said to me, You are my son. Today I became your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nation your inheritance. The whole wide world will be your possession. You will you will break them with an iron rod, shatter them like a clay pot. Therefore, kings be wise, be warned, you judges of the earth. Serve Adonai with fear. Rejoice, but with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish along the way when suddenly his anger blazes. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 1 and 2 establish the predominant things that the Hebrew mind is to think about going forward. Psalm 1 establishes a focus on the law of the Lord, on the Torah. In the post-exilic period, Torah became the central focus of Jewish life. Psalm 1 seems to reflect this. You would think that Psalm 1 is a psalm of David. It's like, hey, David wrote the first psalm. Let's, let's have it in Psalm 1. Uh, no, it's just not that easy. The psalms are anything but chronological. There is not a chronology in it. Uh, this reflects post-exilic understanding of Judaism. Uh, the Torah is the central focus of Jewish life. Psalm 2 establishes the promise and expectation of a Messiah, a son of God who will rule the people or even all of the nations. And so in Psalm 1, the word of God, the law of God, and in Psalm 2, Messianic expectation, right there. Uh, those are the pictures of what I got to place to put that. Of what they are to be all about in the restoration of the people in Judah, the restoration of the temple, the establishment of the synagogues, the development of the scribes, everything that will come is to focus on the Torah and the elevation of the Torah in the people's lives and what that means for them and in establishing the idea that there will be a messianic kingdom, that the ancient one, as Daniel had said, would send one who is just given the authority over all else. So this reflects Second Temple theology. The Second Temple period is the temple that's restored when the exiles come home. And they rebuild the temple and they rebuild the walls and they rebuild the city. And so all of this is more or less done by about, and this is rough, but about 460, 455, and we are in what we call the Second Temple period. And there is a theology associated specifically with the Second Temple period, which is very different from the First Temple period. While in both cases, the focus of life in the temple proper is sacrifice for uh, the atonement of sins and the entire priestly sacrificial system in the second temple theology there's a whole other stream of thought that revolves around 
the exaltation in the lives of the people of the Torah. It's in the second temple season that the Psalter, the corpus of the Psalms, is completed. So the authorship of Psalms runs roughly from David to you could say as late as 400, although probably 450-ish. Uh, you think about how far back on your timeline, where you put David on your timeline, which would have probably been in what? The 900s? And then you, you so you're talking 450 years. The Psalms reflect a lot of different things. So, the Psalms are poetic. Hebrew poetry is uh, not just rhyme or rhythm, and sometimes it doesn't rhyme, but it has rhythm. But it's characterized almost always by a particular sense of parallelism. And there are three forms of parallelism in Hebrew poetry. The first one is synonymous parallelism. Line one and line two have similar repetition. The water saw thee, O God, the water saw thee, and they were seized with anguish. That's a synonymous parallelism. Listen to me, O coastlands, and hearken, you peoples from afar. Synonymous. Line one and two are repetitive, and while the wording is altered, one and two essentially say exactly the same thing. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. This is phrase one repeated in phrase two. The two lines repeat the same idea. In this case, it's an inverted order. It's the end of one line and the beginning of the next line. But even in the inverted order, it's still synonymous. So it's synonymous parallelism. And it's extremely common. The second form of Hebrew parallelism after synonymous is antithetic, where one or more words are repeated in opposite terms. Okay. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You almost have that same kind of picture in Psalm 1, in the first three verses, versus the second three verses. A wise son rejoiceth his father, a foolish son is the grief of his mother. This is antithetical, antithesis. Herein are three sets of opposite. Wise, foolish, joy, grief, father, mother. So you have opposites repeated throughout. That's antithetic parallelism. A third form of Hebrew parallelism is synthetic. So you have synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic, where line two completes or extends the thought in line one. Example, whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in the heaven and in the earth, in the seas and all the deeps. It's constructive parallelism, constructive or synthetic. Another one is the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. Line two and three completes the thought of line one. Now, there are also types of psalms. Uh, we have salvation history psalms, 
A good example is Psalm 105. Okay? It's a retelling of God's action in the history of Israel. This one I didn't mark, and I should have. Give thanks to Adonai, call on his name, make his deeds known among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, talk about all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let those sick in Adonai have joyful hearts. Seek Adonai in his strength. Always seek his presence. Remember the wonders he has done, his signs and his spoken rulings. And it goes on at some length like that. It's the salvation history retelling God's action in their story. And, you know, one of the things about Scripture is that God is active in their story, our story. God is active in the story. Another type of psalm is lament. You know what a lament is. Uh, if you get on Facebook right now, you'll see an alternate between people being brave in some form, people being uh, matter of fact in some form, and then you'll find some people who are just lamenting how they can't do this and they can't do that and things aren't what they normally are. And certainly you can read in the popular press things about life will never be the way it was and stuff like this. And they write laments. A poetic lament is something that contains a complaint and a confession of trust in Elohim. And laments can be individual and they can be community laments. Um, they include praise in the midst of distress. They include the anticipation of deliverance. Uh, then you have songs of thanksgiving. Uh, oh my goodness, Psalm 107 is a great one uh, of thanksgiving to God. Um, and these are community and individual. They can be either. Um, and usually it's thanksgiving in light of a particular event, either recent or historic. Then you have praise hymns. Uh, praise to God in general terms, praise for who he is, for his greatness, for his majesty. And Psalm 100 is certainly the prototypical example for that one. You have festival liturgies, festival songs, um, covenant renewal liturgies, enthronement psalms, songs of Zion. And... Uh, in the transliterated Hebrew in your uh, Jewish study Bible, Zion is the word that begins with that T apostrophe Z, and the T is silent. Uh, so it's still Zion. And then finally, you have songs of trust and meditation. This is exactly what it says. And the Psalms of David certainly are this in some cases noteworthy particularly the 23rd psalm um, so the poetry that's in the bible is rich with imagery of all of the various aspects of life because we just went through festivals and liturgies and trust and meditation and praise and thanksgiving and lament and salvation history. All of these things are a part of Hebrew poetry. And they are a part of the wisdom literature as well. Wisdom literature, Proverbs being one of the prime examples, is a human reflection about life. How shall we live? How shall we live? In the Tanakh, it's reflection within a religious context. I mean, somehow you have to know how you're going to live, how you should live, what standard you measure yourself by, what is good living, what is bad living, what is the good life, what is the better life. Uh, you got to know your way around the world in order to operate in it 
uh, and have any sense of whether or not you're even doing it successfully. And there's always a concern in every culture for one generation to pass on to the next generation uh, things of value, understandings about how to deal with the world and so on. Um, one such assumption is that life is overseen by an omnipotent God. You realize that there are people who impart what's called, here's what we know to be right, that does not make that assumption whatsoever. In fact, makes an assumption very much antithetical to the idea that there is an omnipotent God. But those who would value the Tanakh would assume that life is overseen by the omnipotent God. And you can talk about how does he oversee it, what is the measure of his involvement, but he still oversees it. So biblical wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, which is a big deal in the Proverbs. Another such assumption is that the wise are guided by God. The foolish, therefore, are guided by their own understandings, their own instincts, and their own intellects, apart from the imparted wisdom of God. God imparts his wisdom through his Torah, through his prophets, through his poetry, through the wisdom books, so that we might know the wisdom that is grounded in the love and the fear of the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. I grew up grounded in this idea that knowledge is of people and wisdom is from God. That apart from the influence of biblical understandings and what might be called biblical truths, apart from that, there was only knowledge, and it could be great knowledge, and it could be knowledge that is impressive and can accomplish many things, but it cannot be enduring wisdom. There's a difference between knowing a lot and being wise. There are people who are relatively uneducated who can be very wise. There are people who, well, as my son occasionally puts it, can be uh, the smartest stupid person we know. Um, that's a phrase that, that he periodically trots out in his lifetime. And uh, it is a, his poetic way of saying uh, wisdom escapes them, even though they are brilliant in intellect and with an incredible breadth of knowledge. Wisdom is grounded in the fear and the knowledge of God. This reflects the important functions of instructing the young and instructing people for life. People want to know the what, and they need to know the why, and they have to learn the how, and the how not. So how do you get a distant and self-important people to listen long enough to discover that Scripture is truly the best instruction for life. How do you get there? How do you make that happen?
Israel always interpreted it, its experiences within specific contexts, religious contexts, spiritual contexts, cultural and world contexts. And so their wisdom for us uh, is created in such a way that because it includes the, uh, the specific spiritual, religious, and divine involvement context, it comes to us as a, what we now call a biblical form of wisdom. Um, wisdom literature is human reflection about life and how best to live it. How do we live it? God's word is written in human experience. God's word speaks into the human experience. God's word speaks into the human experience. When God speaks to Abram and says, you will have a son, and Sarah laughs, and Abraham says, this is silly. Um, God says, oh no, it's going to happen, and you can count on it. And uh, right after that, uh, in the way the story is recounted, you have Abram doubting it. He goes on to make a more than one error in his belief that he is too old to, to uh, produce a son, he and his wife both. And uh, the wisdom that God speaks into his life is that you are going to have what I promised you. And the wisdom that comes to us is comes to us through the experiences, the story, and the wisdom that comes out of the story of God speaking in human experience. God doesn't just speak about rules and regulations. God is involved in the experience of human life. So when we talk about genres of wisdom literature in Scripture, we have the sentence proverb saying, which is just a very succinct general truth. Uh, it can be an admonition, it can be an exhortation, it can be a prohibition. Uh, it's just a pithy, short sentence. Um, and it gets the point across. That's a genre. The, um, the overarching term most people choose to use is proverb. Uh, because proverb somehow sounds more biblical than pithy saying. <laughs> but a sentence, a, a proverb, and a saying are the same thing, and they happen to show up in Scripture. There are numerical sayings uh, that bring together lists of events that possess um, similar characteristics. Uh, uh, three things are never satisfied, four of them never say enough, you know, Proverbs 30, Proverbs uh, 6, both have these numerical sayings. In them. Another one is allegory, and you have references there where uh, you have allegorical um, passages of old age and death. Uh, there's autobiography used by the sage to offer learning that's drawn from long experience. Ecclesiastes, in particular, is an example of this. Um, you have uh, dialogue. This is only in Job. Only in Job. Uh, a lot of the religious writings, philosophical musings of the ancient Near East are written in dialogue. But in all the Hebrew corpus, the only thing in dialogue is Job. And it's unique in this sense. Uh, and then you have a list, onomasticon, um, which is, onomasticon literally is 
a listing, a naming, or to the way we would say it in modern English, a list of names on a masticum. It was real common in A and E um, literature. Uh, these catalog natural phenomenon, places, things, activities, locations, and you can find texts that do this in in all of the ancient Near East cultures that recorded their stories. Uh, and you can also see list in Job 38 and 39. And then you have polished poetry. The ideal wife is found in Proverbs 31. It is the perfect example of polished poetry. Um, there are didactic poems that are quite polished in Job and in Proverbs. And then there's a poem in Ecclesiastes 3 that is just quite, quite riveting and so well put together. Uh, so you have all of these genres of wisdom literature. Biblical wisdom literature contains at least two approaches to wisdom. Okay. Or in the form criticism sense, all right? Two approaches, the positive strand and the negative strand. We'll look at the po positive strand for a minute. The positive strand of tradition within wisdom literature represents this confident attitude toward human ability to comprehend and operate in life. God has gifted people with the ability to know, to learn, to understand, to be proactive, to think, to create. Proverbs is full of uh, wisdom that sees humanity as proactive or capable of being proactive. Um, and so it is a positive assessment of the human capacity to understand the ways and wills of God. Now understand, a positive understanding of the human ability to understand the ways and the wills of God. And you contrast that with a negative strand, which says, no, you can't understand the ways and the will of God completely. He's too great to understand. In Rudolf Otto's great descriptive term, he is the holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, other. And there's a strand of skeptical wisdom literature, which questioned traditional assumptions and laid siege to religious claims and gave expression to the anguish of human existence and the torment of living with unanswered questions. God's ways are beyond our ways. He's beyond our comprehension. And Job and Ecclesiastes really can major on this. Ecclesiastes, if you uh, just read it, will wear you out. Because it carries a heavy weight of the idea that we cannot truly know, we cannot truly understand, and we cannot truly accomplish the, the way of God in this world. But paradoxically, both of these strands of wisdom exist side by side in the Bible. Both of them are true. We have great capacity for proactive, engagement, learning, understanding, and application. And yet there are things that we do not understand and we do not grasp because we are not on the other side of the human experience. Uh, God gifts us with the capacity to think and understand, but there are limitations to human knowledge. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to resolve the fact that as, as capable as we are, there are limitations to what we can do today because we are finite 
And maybe the thing we least understand are our limitations and God's abilities in the midst of our limitations. Paul will write rather eloquently to the Corinthian church about this in ages to come. Questions about the literature of wisdom, poetry in the Old Testament. Wow, we've made a really great time. It's uh, it's time for me to get the lights and turn the lights on so that I don't go dark on you before we're finished. So this is time for a short recess. Take about five minutes and I'll get my lights set up. And then we will pick it up and start turning how the Old and the New Testament come together. This one.
All right, let's see. We're going to go around the circle. And I want you, when your time comes, to tell the group who you wrote your person, your paper. Who's your person? And um, what stands out for you in writing your paper? What stands out that <clears throat> you learned or you saw something new or something really spoke to you personally in the person the research you did when you wrote the paper on the person. Uh, we'll start with Amy because you happen to be at the top left corner of my screen. <clears throat> um, I wrote about Hosea um, and I chose Hosea. I said this in my oh, paper. Hold on. Oh. I don't have my ears in. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I wrote about Hosea and I chose Hosea because um, I kind of really want to do some more deep study on Hosea because of a book that I'm writing um, that has some similarities with Hosea's story. So anyway, I, I wanted to dig in and um, I was fascinated by the fact that he became a living metaphor um, for Israel, Israel's relationship with God. Um, where instead of just speaking the words and speaking the prophecy, he literally lived obedience to such an extent that he married a prostitute and had children and named his children what God told him to name them as representations of the dissonance in Israel's relationship with um, God. And I, I just think like, if you're going to look at a prophet and think that a prophet's crazy, <laughs> like Hosea probably would count for that. Um, because there's probably not many people who'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and just go do something crazy like that as a visual example to Israel or whatever country about what they need to fix. So um, that was... That was the thing for me with Hosea. Lindsay. Okay. Lindsay, are you ready? Am I not being heard? I'm having a, I have a poor connection. Everything's breaking up really badly. So I'm okay. sorry. I'm behind here. It's your turn. Did you hear my uh, comment to Amy about what we were doing? Can you, can you, can you say that again? I heard like every every third word. <laughs> Just want you to talk about what you got out of writing your paper on the person. Who was your person and what you got okay. from it? Um, I wrote on Ezekiel and um, I mean, I guess I just had not spent a lot of Well, she froze up on us. Okay. I'll tell you what. Debbie, go ahead. This is strange because I also wrote on Hosea. Uh, and in choosing uh, 
there were several to choose from and I'm that person if I have too many choices I don't know what to do uh, but something just told me to write on Hosea and I had not known anything about Hosea and I know that's sad uh, what interested me was uh, the research and the reading that I did he was not a priest and a prophet he was an ordinary citizen he uh, and there's not a whole lot about uh, his background other than just said a citizen uh, there's not a whole lot written about his call and I just find it very interesting that even in that time God just chose not the qualified but he qualified those he chose uh, and it, it just kind of struck me as very interesting that um, Hosea's life you could bring that into our century and see a lot of that going on uh, him marrying a prostitute him having uh, a wife that has children by other men uh, I could teach that today or preach on it today also that God chooses uh, we think we make the choice but God chooses uh, and I think that's I got a lot of, I mean that struck me that stuck with me uh, and it just it kind of reaffirmed my call in what I'm doing uh, because I was doubting if I was doing the right thing but uh, through reading Hosea uh, it just reaffirmed that yeah I need to keep keep plugging at it uh, but I really thought it was interesting that uh, he prophesied for several through several kings of Judah uh, and a few in Israel and it was the same thing uh, he would tell God would speak through him of uh, okay straighten up or this is what I'm going to do they would straighten up and then God would say but I really don't want to tear Israel away from me they're my chosen and just the back and forth the back and forth uh, it kind of made God seem more human almost uh, with the struggles that we go through should I or should I not uh, and I was thinking of uh, my children through all of this and just how even though they upset me <laughs> sometimes uh, even though they don't do what I think they should I still have that same love for them that God has for Israel uh, sometimes you have to give them tough love sometimes you have to just tell them hey I love you but I, you know we're gonna have to do this uh, a lot of things I read got out of Hosea can I amazing back? how little huh oh I was just gonna say can I piggyback on that for just a second too it's and just say like I, I probably could have written like a whole lot more and I know that probably what I wrote wasn't enough because I was trying to cramp everything in but like yeah there was so there was so much in it that I could have could have elaborated on um because there's a couple of places where there's just like beautiful love letters from God to Israel um like where I literally wept reading them because they're just um and I also <clears throat> felt reaffirmed in my calling in a different way with my writing so anyway sorry i just wanted to i had to okay that's good lindsay you just totally froze on us and so we went on until yeah. we got you back let's try it again yeah sorry our internet's a little with everybody at home i guess it's kind of bogged down um i wrote on ezekiel and honestly i didn't know a lot about him going into it i guess um, but I think I was mostly intrigued by the fact that you had, you said he was known as the crazy prophet. And so that seemed like an interesting one to write on. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of crazy things. And um, 
strange actions throughout his ministry. But one thing that struck me was reading more than once throughout the book where um, God, well, first of all, the fact that he would do those crazy, that Ezekiel would do such crazy things. I feel like he so believed in the calling that God had given him and he was so committed to walk that out. And so therefore he would do these things because he was so um, convicted that this was what he needed to do um, to preach salvation to these people. And uh, I, I, several places, uh, the wording from God to Ezekiel is, if you don't tell them what I'm telling you and they die in their sin, you are responsible. And um, that struck me as a minister and for all of us that um, it's not a light responsibility, a light calling that we have. Um, that souls are depending on us walking in, ob in obedience to our calling. And maybe we'll look crazy sometimes doing it. <laughs> Most likely we will look crazy <laughs> at times. <laughs> that is very good. These, these are very good. Sarah, are you with us? Hello, Sarah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. I can. I want to hear. I want to hear your. Uh, I wrote on Jonah. Uh, I have uh, always loved the story of Jonah, and I kind of relate to Jonah in the fact that when God first called me into the ministry when I was fifty-six years old, I ran. Now I'm glad that I didn't have to get in the belly of a fish to do what God wanted me to do, but. Um, and, and Jonah, when I was writing this paper, I was amazed. I could see so much similarity in the things that he felt and how some of the, the people feel today in the world. You know, we're better than they are. And, and all through the book and all through my paper, it just kept coming to me that as ministers and leaders of the gospel, we need to remember that God is a compassionate God and he does not love one person any more than he loves the other person. Uh, and and that we need to teach and that we need to preach that. And the other thing that really stuck out to me was uh, one of the three things uh, about Jonah was that he was a complainer. Um, and, and we run into so many, or I do, maybe y'all don't run into so many people today that complain about if it's raining, if it's not raining, if the sun's shining, you preach too long, you sang the wrong songs and all of that. And, and I just I just think that it's so important for us to have the same compassion for other people that God has for us. And, and I know I put in my paper that we need to learn to look at the world through our spiritual eyes and not our earthly eyes. Because if we would see other people, other other races, other denominations, everyone in the world with God's eyes instead of our eyes, and quit making judgment on people, how much better off our world would be. It's Tina. Okay, so uh, I wrote on Daniel for the lamest reason. My husband's name is Daniel. So <laughs> I decided to write about Daniel. Um, and it's what we're talking about. We're actually going through um, Daniel in my children's class right now i'm doing videos to like keep up with them and since we can't meet at the church um so i was like this is perfect and something that i i guess like i think debbie said something like this like god will bring something to you and make you think like oh it's your idea but really he's saying like oh i know you need this right now and i think one of the hardest things that i've been struggling with uh, since I lost my mom about a month ago is trusting him and trusting his plans and everything about Daniel is trusting God. <laughs> like Literally, like there wasn't a moment that Daniel was like, uh, wait a second. <laughs> like, I'm not so sure if I can trust you. Like Daniel is just completely faithful and always trusting. And then also something that I've what I learned that other people probably knew, but I actually didn't know. And I guess I just always overlooked it is um anytime daniel was offered something 
um, by King Nebuchadnezzar or his son. I don't know how to say his son's name. <laughs> like when he was offered gifts for um, interpreting the visions and the writing on the wall and the dreams and stuff like that, he always turned them down or told them to like give it to someone else, which I thought was just like, so cool like it just added to the amazing person that dang already was so but yeah thank you it is amazing how the scripture the book the stories speak to each one of us right where we are when we spend time with it um I had a professor who loved to repeat a story that I believe was written by Isaac Singer, um, who is a Nobel laureate for literature. And it was a story that this particular professor of New Testament literature, in this case, um, would relay. And it was about a little boy and the love of the Torah and dancing with the scrolls, dancing with the book, being in love with the book, and looking at his Catholic friend in total confusion when uh, his friend said, what are you talking about? And the little boy said, you don't love the book? Um, we don't love the book as the object of our affection. It's God, but we love the book in that it brings the whole story of us and God, God and us, to life all over again. Every time that we dwell in it, um, I love to have time to dig and look. Um, it is almost like a regenerating experience. And when I get into periodically going back to where I preach my very first sermons out of Mark 4, my first series of sermons, I remember it vividly, um, as uh, simplistic as it might have been, uh, in total structure and formulation, the, the uh, foundational word was uh, something that still speaks to me, but as I go back periodically and look at it again, uh, I see something else. I hear something more, um, and it is regenerating. It, it brings a, a new form of a new energy, a, a new sense of liveliness to me. And I hope that you always get something like that. I also think that now that you know all of the prophets, and you have a list, and you've got a timeline of them, that. You'll make a point over time, maybe just one prophet a year of spending time uh, reading that and rereading that and reading about that and looking at um, Bible studies, maybe a few commentaries, uh, but but expositions on that particular prophet because the prophets get up and speak in so many ways to us when we spend time with them well we kind of come to a point where the title on all the slides that are left is the purpose of divine revelation we preach and teach a revealed religion. We are a people who have received the revelation of God. 
there is a natural religion or a natural theology, which is all of the knowledge, understanding, and insight that we can glean from our side of the equation. And then there is the revealed religion where God pours out into us as people and that becomes the basis of what we now have as the Word of God. God's revelation comes in human history. It is part of human history. The revelation of God, secular events, prehistory, Jewish history, Old Testament history, secular history, all of the various divisions that we create to give definitions so that we can clarify specific details. God doesn't come in all of those ways. He comes in one way. He people in time. And when he comes in time to people, he comes into all of those various components all at once. And the impact of God on all of those things all at once is sometimes seen very brightly and clearly and sometimes seen very dimly. Uh, but the activities and the revelation of God comes in history, in the midst of our experience of life and so he is intimately wound up and bound up with us which is the way he wanted it because otherwise i think he might not have made us he wanted to be bound up with us his creation so god acts within nature and within human history to communicate his truth, which is his word. And what we have is the written word is this, this document that is a compilation of documents that is the revelation of God and the impact of God upon human beings in history. And that revelation comes to us uh, in two ways. Um, it communicates the truth about God and it communicates the truth about us, about creation, about everything that isn't God. Um, and so this, this record that we have of revelation in the scriptures um, tells us who God is, how to relate to God, and what the very basic, fundamental, and sometimes explicit will of God is regarding many aspects of the human endeavor. Interestingly enough, in the process, we learn as much about who we are and about our humanity as we learn about God. I've learned a lot of things in a lot of places, from a lot of books, and a lot of people have poured into my life. The scripture brings more clarity about humanity than any other source that I've had in my life. And it's not because I'm not listening to all these other sources or that I haven't known brilliant people. I've known incredibly brilliant people. And they've poured much into my life. And yet, I've learned more about me and about you and about us through the Scripture than from any other source. Scripture reflects the human condition because Adonai purposed to concern himself with sincere relationships. And this is one of the unusual things <clears throat> about the Jewish Christian record of revelation. God is concerned 
with relationship expresses himself in relationship focuses our hearts and our minds toward relationship rather than simply giving us a book of instructions it's often said that the bible is a how-to manual no it's not a how-to manual it has buried within it things that are parts of a how-to manual but the bible is not a how-to manual it is a series of i love you from god to us and i love you from us to god and i don't really love you very much right now from us to god and love letters from us to one another and hate letters from us to one another and all of the warts and boils and crusty scabs and wounds and open oozing sores of humanity right alongside the warm fuzzies and the sweet I love you's and the I'll fight alongside you until we have no strength left all wrapped up in this one story and God is intimately involved in all of it because he is a God of connectedness, of relationship. Not a God who gives a set of rules and goes off to watch and see whether or not we can keep them. Scripture reflects tension. Always reflects tension. Uh, the tension of who we are, who God wants us to be. I've often used the phrase over the years that uh, we were created to be a people and to be a, a kind of people which was, that's a, that's a speaking of the heart of the issue. When we talk about a kind of people, we're talking about the heart issue. And when I was in college, a fellow who had written some books and made the rounds talking to college students was saying something that was profound and its profundity was so simple as to almost go right by unnoticed. Bob Benson was fond of saying, we are becomers. You see, it's not where I've been, and it's not what I've done, but it's who I'm with and where I am letting him take me. Am I with God and am I letting him take me where he would like me to go and if I in my understanding haven't gotten there is not the point the point is am I going there am I walking on the journey with Jesus you know we can tell all the standards right we can we can list rules we can put up all of the things and this is the kind of person I want to be and this is the kind of person God says I ought to be and and we could take a line out of Amos and say uh, this is the plumb line and we must be measured by this straight line do we measure up and walk straight by God's uh, way or do we not um, but you know we look at these uh, we look at these standards and then we find unacceptable human behavior. And we even find it among heroes. I mean, think about a New Testament hero for just a minute. Peter. Peter's catalog of impetuosity, occasional insight, misunderstanding cultural arrogance that is Jewish versus non-Jewish in that time and place 
Um, he's a man who is sometimes unaware of his simplicity and is sometimes too aware of it. He is a man who is uh, as likely to be given to his fear as to his faith. He can be a braggart. Um, he has so many character moments that we look at and go, I don't want to be that way. And yet, he's one of the heroes of Scripture. The Catholic popes all have said that they walk in the shoes of Peter. I'm simply saying that God's heroes have warts, and open sores, and wounds. Scripture doesn't shy away from any of the humanity of who we are. Uh, accounts in the Bible include polygamy, adultery, murder, deceit, idolatry, all kinds of stuff. What do we do with that? What do we do with plural marriages? Uh, what do we do with the fact that David, a man after God's own heart, um, has multiple wives? Well, what do we do with the fact that yeah, he's been on the throne a long time and he's, he's had a lot of success and he sees a woman as somebody else's wife and he says, hey, bring her to me. And he exercises his... Uh, royal prerogative to do everything that he shouldn't do from adultery to trying to cover it up, the cover up leading to murder, and he had to be called out by the prophet of God. Uh, I mean, that's serious stuff, and that's one of the heroes, and he's a man after God's own heart, and yet the Bible doesn't hide any of that. What do we do with slavery in the story of God's people? What do we do with men having the right to demand divorce, but women not having the right to demand divorce? We can take almost anything that we see in our culture today that we say is right or good in the way we talk about ethics and we can read back into the story and say ooh they're not they're not living up to a, a biblical standard many old testament characters uh, are depicted with more than one wife sam saul consults a, a, a medium to uh, contact dead samuel um Sometimes the Bible references something that we might think is objectionable without any uh, ethical commentary or judgment. And yet in other places, those things are utterly rejected. Um, like the legal materials in the Old Testament forbid sorcery. The law of Moses forbids it. Uh, Solomon's downfall is attributed to the fact that he's got a lot of wives and copy of concubines from a lot of countries and cultures and religions, and he allows all of them to bring their idols into the country and create their own religious cult following their own gods uh, right alongside the worship of Adonai. Idolatry is condemned... Uh, specifically more than any other single act. Yet, the wisest man in the world, Solomon, was guilty of exactly this. Some of these issues get addressed uh, in the New Testament. Um, some are addressed explicitly in the New Testament, like Paul giving his admonition that um, the leader in the church should be the husband of one wife, or considering that I'm the only man in this particular operation tonight, that maybe we should say that, that uh, 
the leader of the church should have only one husband. Same point. Um, that's an explicit instruction to the New Testament church. There are a lot of other instructions that go with that, of course. Um, the point, usually, almost always, is that practices that are unacceptable are those that impose that oppose the basic will of God's revealed law or God's revealed will. Um, the intent of the law is, as Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These matter, and upon these two, everything else hangs. And if you get these two wrong, it doesn't matter if you get all the rest of it right. That's what he says. Any practice that detracts from the love of God and the proper love of neighbor has to be questioned seriously. Um, idolatry, um, ancestor worship. I remember as a child when my dad came home from his time in China uh, that one of the things that he had experienced up close for the first time was ancestor worship. Sorcery, which, you know, there's all kinds of stuff available today, going to computer typing, anything having to do with the occult, and you can ha have it in your living room. Uh, all of these kinds of things. And, like, you know, the list just could be exhaustive. Um, if they place reliance upon a source that is opposed to or undermines our loyalty to the Lord God in Christ Jesus, then that is a compromise too far. Uh, likewise, um, adultery and polygamy are compromises too far because they compromise love for one another that is reflective of the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You read Jesus on marriage and Jesus on relationships, and he uses the marriage imagery. Um, and he talks about the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you get this picture that, that love is supposed to, in this life, be reflective of the kind of pure relationship that exists in the Godhead Trinity. So we must guard ourselves and guide one another to avoid compromises that um, undermine uh, intimate affection when we're, we're talking about polygamy and adultery and so forth, for example. If it undermines that, if it compromises the commitment that we've made to that one person, then it's something that needs to be seriously questioned. Um, there are a lot of themes that can be traced through the Old Testament and followed right through into the New. The overall theme that serves as a good organizing principle is a theme of covenant. Because covenant kind of uh, is a running theme in the Old Testament. I mean, you've written on covenant. You've got the, the Noah Covenant and the Abraham, Abrahamic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant and the Davidic Covenant. And you've, you've got these pictures. Um, and, and Covenant serves well because it's tied to so many other significant concerns. And so in the first covenant with Noah, God demonstrates uh, his love for humanity. I'll never destroy it again. In the second covenant with Abraham and Sarah... Um, is I'm not just going to preserve the race. I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. The third covenant 
to become a holy nation. Whoa, that's a way step beyond where he's been before. At Sinai, they are called to be a royal priesthood and a holy people. So at Sinai, they are being called to point the way for everyone else to Adonai. Uh, and so in the context of that covenant, then God delivers the law through Moses. And the intent of the law is expressed in the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And you are to love your neighbor. Um, and that is to reflect the kind of Trinity love that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The historical books reflect the struggles of the people of Israel in the attempt to be faithful to God. And to God's calling, um, the concern of maintaining right relationship with God um, is threaded through that whole story, both individually and nationally. The prophets proclaim the word of the Lord in an attempt to bring about uh, the necessary direction to a nation that has become apostate and run away from their covenant commitment with God. Um, the, the prophet's purpose is to restore covenant relationship. Again and again, it's about restoring covenant relationship. And... Um, the aim of the sacrificial system is the cleansing of sins and the offering of a life to God, which is covenant relationship. And finally, the poetic wisdom literature uh, provides an expression of human responses to this ongoing struggle to maintain right relationship, to live a covenant life with God and neighbor. And it gives us a practical insight into how God works. And the wisdom literature recognizes the grandeur of God's design and reflects the positive and negative response of humanity to it. And these themes are ultimately fulfilled in the coming of Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. He fulfills all the character and behavior ideals of the Tanakh. He is the one who is the perfect covenant keeper. He is the one who comes with the law of God written on his heart of flesh, who gives to us as had been foretold so long ago, that very blessing call to holiness is modeled and fulfilled in Christ and then proclaimed in the Acts and the Epistles. And they proclaim that this covenant life ideal, which we call a holiness of heart and life, to be available in Jesus Christ. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is the enabler of the ideal. Let's say that clearly. The Ruach HaKadosh enables us to live the ideal of Christ, not perfection in the English meaning of the word, not infallibility, not incapable of any failure, not having lived every day without having one rotten thought. That's saying we can live by perfection, but the Ruach HaKadosh enables us to live the ideal because the very living God is within us guiding us in the ways that we should go, 
guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, bringing to our thinking at the appropriate time all that he has taught us and all that is in his word and reminding us over and over and over all the time that we indeed are his and he is ours. So this, this survey that we've run through of the Tanakh points us to Yeshua HaMashiach made real in our hearts by the work of the Ruach HaKodesh, who through the sacrificial death, the resurrection life offered to us through Christ Jesus, through Yeshua, makes possible in us living this covenant life. So what does that mean? If we don't live in perfection, but we live in covenant, it means that in John Wesley's term, uh, we must make confession daily for every place and every way in which we have fallen short of the uh, standard of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we are to walk in uprightness before him so long as we are not willfully disobedient. In other words, I need to confess my sin of being short-sighted, wrong in reaction, initial reaction to something that I've been asked to do. Um, I am asked to confess and repent of having punished one child for what I later discover another child did and then go to those kids and deal with that you get the idea don't you I mean these these are real real things where we haven't intentionally done something contrary to what we know God would have us do and yet we have upon reflection, quickly realized, I shouldn't have said that, or I punished the wrong child, or I should have uh, been slower to speak in those circumstances. And that's one we could all say, I'm sure. Um, so we, we make confession as covenant people that we want to fulfill the ideal of Christ every day. Even as we walk in the holiness of heart and mind, seeking every day by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to fulfill the ideal to which Yeshua HaMashiach has called us to walk uprightly as children of the Most High God and to walk with Him in the simple love, which in its simplicity is also profound, that he gives to us. And so as you read the prophets and you preach the prophets and you teach the prophets and you write the prophets and the wisdom and the psalms and the histories and the law and the prehistory, there is in all of it, this ongoing thread of love of God reaching down to pull us into covenant communion with him and with one another. And you have limitless material for this. So where does this leave us? Malachi has quit writing. The second temple has been built. The walls are repaired. The Achaemenid Empire is at its peak. And the Achaemenid dynasty, dynasty 
uh, is the family house of Persia. Uh, it's in the same manner that Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain is said to be of the House of Windsor. Uh, Elizabeth I, having been um, uh, a Tudor. I said that wrong. Yeah. Tudor. Into the world of a restored Yuda come a whole new set of influences and experiences that are critical to bridge the story of the Tanakh with the story of the New Testament. The story of the Old and the New Testaments have a bridge. The bridge is that 400 years. They're anything but silent. They're anything but quiet. Um, into the mix. We have to start by saying there are some philosophic schools that are, we might call them pseudo-religious, they would have called them religions, that are going to have an influence all over the known Mediterranean world, really from the gates of India to um, the British Isles, and in Africa as far south as um, at least Ethiopia, and all the way across northern Africa and around the western rim of Africa past Morocco, and all the way through Europe, almost to the gates of uh, Denmark. These schools of what we call philosophy, they would have called religion, that begin to have a, a significant influence among the uh, peoples of the Mediterranean Basin are Stoicism and Epicureanism. They are different schools of thought. They are different ways of coming at things. They have different issues and ideals. But they are um, both um, devoid of a personal God. Uh, they both emphasize how you live your life. They are both um, pseudo-religions that are uh, focused on ethics, how to live this life. And, and they have different ways of coming at that. The details of them aren't nearly as important tonight as just knowing that they are there and they become influential and in a sense they are representative of um, the ancient Near East turning into the Greco-Roman Near East and the Greco-Roman Near East is going to become a different world from the ancient Near East. And while there is a continuity that flows through it, there are significant transformative changes that happen. And so you've got these various pseudo-religious concepts that uh, gather to themselves the more learned and educated um, might call it the business and uh, governmental elite of the Greco-Roman world are certainly versed in this. Um, the famous Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius <coughs> um, is known as 
one of the three Stoic emperors. He wrote on uh, aspects of what he believed. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that it is uh, well remembered, not necessarily well thought of, but well remembered in uh, Western literature. As that begins to bubble and permeate the Greek culture or the culture of Hellas, the, uh, the literal technical name of Greece is Hellas. And so to Hellenize something is to make it more and more Greek. Um, some interesting things begin to happen. Um, the Achaemenid dynasty, like all dynasties, eventually begins to weaken. And um, by 340, um, it's, it's tottered for a number of decades. And there is a new king on the throne who is attempting to stabilize it, to stop rebellions that have happened within its borders. And during that time, between 400 and 340, we have the first uh, recorded example of an anti-Semitic riot. Now, those are our terms from our age. But in Egypt, there was a uh, famous event where there was a riot against the Jewish community in a city. Uh, there was much property damage, loss of life, as the locals rioted and rampaged against uh, the Jews of the city. What happens in the Babylonian, Median, Medo-Persian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire is ruled by the Achaemenid dynasty. What happens in that empire, as they allow all of the various polyglot of peoples to have their own places, even if they have been removed from their original homes, you get what amount to communities. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the largest Kurdish city in the world outside of the boundaries of the cultural area known as Kurdistan, which straddles the borders of Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. The largest Kurdish city outside of that area in the entire world is Nashville, Tennessee. There is an area of the city where many Kurds live. Uh, it is in that sense that there were Jewish communities that had grown up in various places across the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, the Jewish diaspora had and we could spend a lot of time talking about how it got there, but it had spread. And from Alexandria, Egypt, all the way into what we now call Iran, uh, you will find Jewish communities. And by this time, you will find synagogues, and you will find the reading of the Torah, and you will find Jews who are prosperous merchants, and you will find Jews who are not. Uh, you will find Jews who are day laborers, and you will find Jews who are um, among the educated elite of a given city. But the Jews in this time period are people who have um, what other people see as a religious and cultural distinctiveness. And there will be periodic anti-Jewish actions 
that crop up here and there for all kinds of local reasons. What we call anti-Semitism did not exist as such in the year 400 before Jesus. Uh, but the first known, we call it in our terminology, anti-Semitic riot, is before Alexander the Great walks onto the world stage. And we are at that point when we get here. Um, Alexander of Macedon walked onto the world stage at a propitious moment. His father, Philip II of Macedonia, had developed a professional army um, not quite like any that had been seen to that point. And uh, technologically, tactically, organizationally, uh, his army was like the army of, say, the United States in the year 2000 compared to the military capability of Afghan tribesmen or the military capability of the uh, military forces of Thailand picking things out of the air that to show a significant disparity. The Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire of the Achaemenid dynasty could put hundreds of thousands of people on a battlefield. And before Philip of Macedon, they had usually been successful. But by the time he was assassinated and his son Alexander came to the throne, he had created a military of technological and tactical and organizational prowess that gave him an advantage going into any battle or any series of battles that make up a campaign. His son took that and ran with it. And it just happened that his son was a tour de force. Uh, Alexander was uh, a tactical genius for his age. He had an eye for where and when and how and who to fight as few commanders in history ever had compared to their contemporaries. And he was, he was consumed with the idea of uniting the entire known world. You could say that Alexander was the person who was out to create the first one world government. And he came remarkably close to, uh, taking all of the lands that he knew existed into that empire. All that really matters to our story is that uh, he comes to the throne 335, 336. Um, and by 334, 333, he is marched through Palestine, not yet called Palestine. He's marched through Yuda and all of the lands around and has conquered Egypt. And on his way back through Palestine, because he's headed across toward the heartland of Persia, he, um, and eventually India, uh, he places the Samaritans under Judah well, you know, Samaritans and the Judeans didn't like each other. They didn't like each other 300 years before Jesus any more than they liked each other when Jesus walked amongst them. And Alexander went on his way, and by 323, he was dead. Um, his empire was divided among three generals, and... 
It just so happens that Judah was in the Seleucid Empire, and that name is taken from one of those generals. And eventually it winds up in the Syrian orbit. And the importance of this is that these various overseer um, governments and armies are very, very Hellenized. They are Greek oriented in culture, in philosophy, in religion, in temperament, in their pantheon of gods, in their military organization, in the way they start to look at and structure society and in how they respond to other religions such as Judaism. Eventually among those Syrian rulers um, will come a series of three who will provoke a massive reaction, a revolt. And among those three uh, will be those rulers, those three rulers will be uh, the famous one, Antiochus Epiphanes, who would then be called by the people Epimenes. Um, Epiphanes meaning the glorious one, Epimenes meaning the profaner, because he had profaned the temple. Um, the, the second and third of those three rulers took it as their calling in life, one of their callings in life, to erect the rights of Judaism. And um, in 166 uh, BCE, um, the Maccabean Revolt began, and it takes its name from Judas Maccabeus. And because the family name is from the family name is translated as Hasmonean. The Hasmonean priesthood uh, will lead to the people being at least autonomous, if not independent all the time, for about a hundred years. But Judah being in the midst of um, the crossroads of ancient trade, which meant money. There was a constant, constant struggle with other powers around them as there had always been. This kind of came to a screeching halt, multiple powers, uh, in the year 65 when Pompey, who had been part of the group that had ruled Rome, uh, when Pompey took sides and the rulers of Judah took note that they had to listen. The Hasmoneans eventually occupied the office of high priest. You can remember the Persians um, had allowed the priesthood to start taking on secular tasks. And so ruling the country as the chief priest and high priest was just as effective as calling them king. Uh, but eventually, from 42 BC, the king who would come from Idumea, which is to the south of Judah, which is from those hated descendants of those hated Edomites, uh, would come Herod the First, Herod the Great, the Edomian, the half Jew, hated by all Jews and hateful of all Jews, who would, with Roman approval, uh, he would side with the right people in the Roman civil wars, and he would come out on the right side. Uh, with the man who would become uh, Augustus Caesar. 
whose given name was Octavian, um, and would be the first emperor of Rome. Uh, Herod would come to rule the land. Politically, that gets you to Jesus' time. Now, let's go back and talk about religiously for a minute. In that time period, roughly from the year 350, 400, 350, somewhere in there, um, there, there begins to develop over the course of 100 years what came to be called the office of the scribes. As in the land of Judah, there was a slow transition from Hebrew to Aramaic. It came to be that the scribes were almost the only people who understood the Hebrew scriptures. By Jesus' day, they had uh, an outsized influence because they were the interpreters of the law. Why? Because they were the ones who read Hebrew. So in the Middle Ages, when uh, secular rulers turned to monasteries and said, what does the Bible say? They were asking them because those were the only people who knew how to read the thing. You had the scribes and you had the priests. Well, you've got the temple priests, the people who are of a priestly tribe where a person will serve sacrificially in the temple um, maybe once in his lifetime in some cases. Uh, and all of those who were of the temple priesthood would serve at least one time uh, for a prescribed amount of time in the temple doing temple sacrifice. And then you had the priesthood and then you had the scribes who were the interpreters of the law and then you had local rabbis and wandering rabbis. So when Jesus started teaching, or when John came, the Baptist, came preaching and teaching, the fact that they were on the road doing this wasn't particularly unusual. They just happened to be very unusual people who stood out. In the time between the year 300 and 100, the Hasidim, the pious ones, uh, have as their descendants um, the Pharisees. Well, that's an overstatement to make the point. Um, so when Jesus comes, you have two parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Here's what's important about that. The Pharisee literally means separatist, to separate yourself. And they aimed at a higher degree of spiritual sanctity and moral strictness than had been the norm. And they are the ones who made the Mishnah, or all of the collections that make up the Talmud, equal in importance to the Law of Moses and utterly enforceable and something that you must keep all of it, all of the commentaries on the commentaries on the law. And you know that the Mishnah grew up because there were all kinds of details about, well, how does, uh, you know, if we're going to disinherit a son who's rebellious, what's the definition of rebellious? That wasn't in Moses' law. So we have to have definitions of what is rebellious. Then we have to have definitions on how to restore a son who is repentant and all these various things like we've talked about before. So the Pharisees believe all of that is enforceable. They dress, they give, they pray, and they live conspicuously to show anyone and everyone that they are the separatists. They are the Pharisees or Prussian. Then you have the Sadducee party, which is a small group relative to the whole population. The Pharisees are far more uh, 
populace and far more have penetrated general culture, living amongst the people. The Sadducees are Hellenized to a degree, to a degree. They are the conservative priestly upper crust. They are what we would call the elitists of that society. They rejected everything but the Pentateuch as authoritative. Well, you can see where they and the Pharisees would have great struggles because they totally reject all of the commentary and the oral law, all of the rabbinic teachings. They rejected, therefore, all of what the Pharisees took as scripture from the prophets, the wisdom, the poetry, the histories. They only accepted the Pentateuch. So therefore, they rejected angels, spirits, demons, and immortality, all of which the Pharisees accepted. You got two radically different religious pseudo political parties who dominate the discourse of public life. And then you have the neighborhood where people lived. And you had the synagogue, and you had a local rabbi, and the local rabbi taught the accepted theology and wisdom of the day. Um, and there are two rabbinical schools that have grown up in the Jewish diaspora that are considered to be the source or the locus of the great rabbinical commentaries and teaching of the last 400 years. The Alexandrian school and the Babylonian school. The Alexandrian school carries great weight because over the course of almost 100 years, uh, ending about the year one, beginning about the year 150, um, one of the Ptolemaic emperors had uh, commissioned the translation of the Hebrew scriptures by scribes into Greek. It took almost 100 years to produce what came to be called the Septuagint, which became widely circulated and because uh, the typical Jew in the diaspora all over the world spoke a local language. And the Jews of Judea and Galilee spoke Aramaic. Pentateuch. Uh, not the Pentateuch, the, the, the Septuagint became the Jewish scriptures. Why? Because Greek was the lingua franca of the day. It was a language of business all over the world. If you could speak Greek well enough to communicate, you could do business. And so the Septuagint went all over the world as the Jewish scriptures. And so the school of Alexandria had significant influence through the production of that script. So all of these forces are at work by the time the Roman age is upon them. And in the fullness of time, that's the phrase Luke uses, isn't it? In the fullness of time, as he begins the story of Jesus' birth, you have one language, which is Greek, that unites the world enough to communicate. You have a world spanning road and shipping network. Romans are the master builders of the ancient world. Uh, interestingly enough, Roman roads don't have curves, but they built them everywhere. Furthermore, they uh, called the Mediterranean Sea Mare Nostrum, which is our sea, our lake. And they had a vast shipping, trans-shipping network. Uh, Roman shipping traveled 
Roman goods traveled to the Persian Gulf and traveled from the Persian Gulf to and from India. So they are establishing trade with the Far East. The Peace of Augustus, the Pax Augustianus, had come into play. The world, relatively speaking, um, certainly within the Roman borders, was at peace. Um, and there was a plethora of religions and pseudo-religions all over the known world. And all of them provided less than satisfactory answers for everyday ordinary people. You have a world that is primed for the story of God to break out of Judah, Judea, or as the Romans were calling it, Palestina, into the rest of the world. And it's into this world, into this story, that Jesus is born. Questions? It's a lot, I know. But it kind of gives you that bridge. So... Now we come to the point where you get your assignment for next week. I'm waiting to see the look on everybody's face. <laughs> Keep learning that to not pray for one another. That's the assignment for next week. So it's been a joy to be with you. I hope you've gotten something of value from this process that we've been through. Anybody have anything you want to say before we sign off tonight? Thank you for your instruction. It's been good to be with you all. That's thank what I was you. Say too. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> I very much enjoy doing it. I think you realize that. I, I want to say it. thank you as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I will see you down the road. Keep on keeping on. And before you know it, um, the uh, superintendent will be standing over you and saying, I, had, I um, ordain you in the church of God. And um, it'll be a moment you'll never forget. Stay with it. You'll get there. Thank you. Okay. Thank all Thank of you. you. All righty. Good night. Good night. Bye.